I want to welcome you to our event this evening. Uh, we have a special guest, Ambassador Paula Dobriansky, who is a friend of mine from, I was going to say an old friend of mine, but neither of us are old, but we've been friends for many years. Oh, you're there, okay. So Ambassador, Ambassador Dobriansky is a foreign policy expert, a former diplomat specializing in national security affairs, and a senior fellow at Harvard at the Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs. With more than 25 years of experience, she held high-level positions as Under Secretary of State for Global Affairs, the President's Envoy to Northern Ireland, receiving the Secretary of State's highest honor, the Distinguished Service Medal, the NSC Director of the National Security Council Director for European and Soviet Affairs, Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Human Rights and Humanitarian Affairs. She also served on the Defense Policy Board and the Secretary of State's Foreign Affairs Board. I could go on, but let me just mention several things. One is Paul is widely respected, and I have to say she was on shortlist to be the Secretary of State, just so some of you know who we're dealing with this evening. Under Secretary of State, there are five levels at the State Department. There's Secretary, there's one Deputy Secretary. Four undersecretaries? Uh, six. 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 And then, then there are, I don't know, 20 assistant secretaries and then deputy assistant and then it goes down. So Paula's at the upper end of the elite at the State Department. And um, I had fights with State. The one person I did not have fights with was Paula Dobriansky. I have to tell you one amusing thing. Uh, her father, Lev Dobriansky, was my professor of economics 52 years ago. And he gave me a B in the economics course, and I was traumatized by it. I'm only joking. At, at those days, a B is what an A is now, because there's been so much great inflation. At least that's what one of the Jesuits told me. Uh, uh, Lev Dobriansky is a, a very f a famous figure at Georgetown and in the foreign policy community. Uh, I shouldn't say this, but I think he was one of the only two registered Republicans on the faculty at Georgetown. This is 52 years ago. <laughs> Paula has her, her, her master's degree and her PhD, her a master's degree and her PhD from the Foreign Service School at Georgetown. No, PhD is from Harvard, and your master's degree is from Georgetown. Undergraduate from Georgetown. And okay, the, uh, you got it straight. So it, we're very pleased to have with us this evening my good friend, Ambassador Paula Dobriansky. Well, good evening to all of you, and first, uh, thank you so much, uh, Andrew, for that uh, very warm introduction. I'm delighted to be here, and I'm glad you don't hold it against me about the grade. <laughs> um, but um, uh, when Andrew told me, uh, when we were colleagues in government, uh, that in fact that he had my dad for uh, economics at Georgetown, I was very, very heartened to hear that. Uh, and I, I view him as family, if I could, if I could say that. I do want to say to all of you, uh, not only a hearty good evening, but that I am truly, truly delighted to be here, uh, thinking about all of Texas A and M, uh, A and M University, and then no less the Bush School of Government and Public uh, Service here, but then even more so, uh, of course, uh, the Scowcroft Institute of International Affairs. Just all three very, very prestigious and reputable institutions. So it's an honor and a privilege to be here this evening. And uh, I'm glad that, uh, uh, that uh, Andrew, uh, he, in, he invited me, by the way, a couple of years ago before COVID. And I thought, well, you know, maybe he might have moved on, but he didn't. And I'm really glad that you didn't. And I'm glad especially to be able to come here in person. The topic uh, this evening is uh, focused on great power competition and looking at what are America's challenges and opportunities. Uh, I'm only going to put forth a few ideas uh, in my about 15 minutes, and then I look forward to our wide-ranging uh, exchange. Uh, first, I'd start with just the point that I do identify with the fact that we are living in an era of great power competition. And how does one define it? One defines it as a geopolitical environment of expanding competition and rivalry among great powers. 
Here, uh, uh, one looks at predominantly China and Russia, and that's what I'm going to take a little bit of time to speak to. But first, I'd like to cite back in 2018, uh, when he was the former Secretary of Defense, James Mattis, James Mattis I think cogently made a, a statement relevant to great power competition. He said, quote, great power competition is now the primary focus of US national security. He's absolutely right. It's our organizing principle. It is a primary uh, focus of US national security. How did it become so? Going back to the last administration, the Trump administration, it was in December of 2017 when they issued the required by Congress national security strategy. And in it was the articulation of uh, great power competition, specifically that the United States is in this competition with China, with Russia. And then it was later in January of the following year, 2018, when the Department of Defense also issued its strategic d uh, document, which also made the same uh, ar articulation. And I might just add that also going fast forward to now the Biden administration, they did something that was a little bit unusual. They issued actually in March of last year, after he came, uh, President Biden came actually right into office, they issued what constituted an interim national security strategy guidance, that's what they called it. It was to articulate, again, what is the environment in which we're operating. So let me just mention that. This was a quote from that document. It said, quote, we face a world of rising nationalism, receding democracy, growing rivalry with China, Russia, and other authoritarian states, and a technological revolution that is reshaping every aspect of our lives, unquote. So in this connection, definitely our principal rivals, China, Russia, do pose a very significant uh, challenge abroad. And think about it before the focus on what we're witnessing now playing out in Ukraine. This was definitively the case. What is it that brings together both China and Russia? And fundamentally, both actually, as competitors with the United States, seek to diminish our power, US power and influence globally, and they collaborate towards that end. And at the same time, they're also very determined to fragment our alliances, as well as our partnerships, and undermine what constitutes a fundamentally a rules-based uh, international order. And they seek to replace it with a fundamentally a different system, uh, a system which uh, has no respect for human rights, a system which does not um, uh, support the kind of values, the values of freedom, uh, uh, a rule of law, uh, the very essence of what we are about, and no less, uh, I would say, the West is about. So let me go to what are the primary challenges that we do confront in this broad context of, of great power competition? And then also, are there any opportunities for cooperation? Simply going to China, and I'm gonna do China first and then Russia second. In China, we see under uh, uh, the Chinese President Xi Jinping, so many different kinds of changes that really confront uh, not just the United States, but also the Asian uh, and Indo-Pacific region. The Chinese Communist Party has become more heavy-handed in its governance of China. We've seen that very definitively. If you follow the details, the economy there has also become more state-driven. Uh, notions of, oh, some kinds of seeds of entrepreneurship and capitalism here and there, uh, that's really gone by the wayside. Beijing has also, as I've already suggested, has aligned itself more closely with Russia, politically, economically, and militarily. And then I know you have read about the maritime disputes that have been ongoing in the East China Sea and the South China Sea. And then very significantly, there are heightened military threats and also aggressive behavior that continues towards Taiwan. 
As you know, there are many who look at what's happening in Ukraine, and then always one of the questions is, well, will we see Xi Jinping take the same kind of action towards Taiwan? Let's move Ukraine aside for the mo moment. I would say that regardless of that, I think that uh, uh, China has been always focused on Taiwan and uh, is, is very concerned about its direction and wants to ensure that militarily, uh, not just politically, that it is, to use the term, one with, uh, with, uh, uh, with China. Um, I would also say that we've witnessed a lot of intimidation campaigns that have wa been waged not just towards Taiwan, but India. We saw the over-the-border aggression that took place in, uh, in India, uh, Japan, even Vietnam, Vietnam as a, uh, a communist-based uh, uh, state. Um, and then we've seen an intimidation campaign waged against Australia, and then Lithuania. Lithuania, as a very small country, has stood up against China, which has been very significant. Uh, they have refused to operate with China on any of the terms that the Chinese have, have demanded. Um, and we also know that the World Trade Organization rules are not abided by. Uh, intellectual property theft uh, still continues afoot. There's dumping of goods, unfair labor, use of state uh, subsidies, and then egregious human rights abuses continue unabated, in, certainly in Tibet and no less in Xinjiang uh, province. And we know that Hong Kong's autonomy has been compromised. Um, so, and then no less, the recent nuclear-capable capable hypersonic missile was recently tested by the Chinese. So that backdrop just is a challenge for us in so many of those different spheres. It's not just military. It's also a political battle of ideas. It's also an economic uh, challenge. Um, the growth of the Chinese uh, defense and military capabilities, according to General John Hayden, uh, Hayden, excuse me, um, who's vice chair of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and Washington's most uh, second most senior uh, military officer, he said he categorized what's going on militarily in China and what they've been doing. He used the term stunning, that it's absolutely stunning. He called the rapid rise of China's military an unprecedented nuclear modernization. And then uh, even went on to say that Russia announced its nuclear modernization plan in 2006, and it's followed through on it, and Russia is still the most imminent threat, simply because they have 1,500 deployed nuclear weapons, plus or minus, and China has roughly 20% of that. So he was looking at uh, both in this, uh, in this uh, context. So um, simply, I wanted to give a broad overview of the kinds of challenges that we are confronted with with China. Let me go to Russia briefly. Russia is uh, and has been a geopolitical um, uh, competitor. Some of you may remember that when Senator Romney, then he was a presidential candidate, he actually categorized Russia as the greatest geopolitical foe. And he was absolutely right then, and he's absolutely correct now. The only challenge here that I would submit is when we look at what's happening in this competition, Russia has usually been cast as a bit over to the side, that it's China that presents the biggest challenge to us. I have argued against that, and I've argued against that predominantly because Russia has the dominant nuclear uh, weapons, uh, number of nuclear weapons and the nuclear power. It is a nuclear power. But secondly, we've witnessed that Russia has been a destabilizing force in so many different arenas, as we've seen. When you look at it, what they did in Grozny, uh, then you look at Ukraine in 2014 with the illegal annexation of Crimea and no less the occupation of the Donbass region, and then no less before that, uh, the, the uh, occupation of Ossetia uh, in Georgia. Um, one could go on, no less their destabilizing influence relative to Iran. Um, uh, and their uh, uh, provisional uh, assistance and support for Iran. 
So even though both China and Russia have are aligned because of their desire to diminish U.S. power uh, and also to fragment our alliance structure, um, that nevertheless, they're not exactly the same, but I would never discount uh, the Russia's ability to destabilize and uh, no less to do what it's doing now. Uh, but unlike China, Russia's um, power is not derived from its economy, clearly. It's worth your noting, uh, worth your knowing, and my noting, uh, that uh, since 2009, its economy has stagnated uh, with an average annual growth of 1%. Uh, the capital flight from the country has just been, uh, you know, the numbers are very, very, very high. And the foundation for its global role is really just built on its massive nuclear arsenal. Um, I've mentioned to you how and what's the figure roughly of uh, its nuclear ar arsenal. In terms of nuclear warheads, though, it has some 6,400 nuclear warheads. Um, simply to give a summary of what is the challenge posed by Russia, well, it, it definitely uses proxies, it uses economic instruments, it excels at disinformation campaigns, election interference, corrupt relationships, and it also uses certainly energy as a weapon. And we've seen that with regard to the countries um, in, um, in, in Europe. And in addition to pursuing its own interests throughout Europe, it definitely has worked very hard to undermine our own interests and really to take always the opposite position from the United States. It is a destabilizer, it's a disruptor. Let me go to a third challenge, which is something that's functional, but wielded by both China and Russia, and that is new forms of warfare and competi uh, commu competition. Here, it's really evolved. Uh, traditional warfare has overall taken somewhat, I'll use that term, somewhat of a backseat. Uh, we are seeing some traditional warfare certainly taking place in the scorched earth uh, uh, plan in uh, Ukraine. But at the same time, both China and Russia have invested a great deal of their R&D in looking at emerging technologies and dual use fields, whether it's artificial intelligence, robotics, unmanned systems, space, uh, cyber attacks. There have been countless cyber attacks. When I look at the European arena, for example, and how Russia has wielded cyber attacks, uh, Sweden uh, has had Estonia, uh, not just Ukraine. Uh, all of these countries have been uh, attacked. A term that's used now uh, actually for both of these countries is the use of or the categorization of digital authoritarianism, actually which is on the rise, digital tools and technologies that have really advanced their disruptive and repressive goals of these great powers, and also the widespread um, uh, 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 use of misinformation as well as disinformation here. Um, simply put, those are that's the, the challenge, and I'm giving a broad brush because I know we'll dig deeper. Uh, and I didn't want to give a, uh, a, a, a lengthy uh, speech up front, but just an overview up front for you. But let me pose, well, what are the opportunities? Are there any opportunities here? And I want to mention four to you that I do see in this uh, window of great power competition. The first is actually the transatlantic relationship. You know, in, in an ironic way here, I think it's been really propelled forward certainly by what's been happening in Ukraine. But let's say Ukraine didn't happen. I actually see an opportunity where actually many of the European countries who are either part of the NATO alliance or we have strong partnerships with, I think have been very concerned about the challenges posed, especially by China, but also certainly by Russia and as magnified by Ukraine. And let me just share with you, I mean, some statements you've heard, maybe not have heard, there's the European Union High Representative Joseph Perel. Burrell. He claimed that the West was naive regarding China when he was looking back. The way in which we've you know, reached out and have embraced China, that we really should not have done that. We should have been much more focused on really what 
China's goals and uh, uh, certainly its uh, mission is. The NATO Secretary General who came and was invited to speak before our Congress, Jen Stoltenberg, he stated the following, quote, in a world of greater global competition where we see China coming closer to us from the Arctic to cyberspace, NATO needs a more global approach. Uh, unquote. And then, and then I would say that there have also been a number of European countries that have been appalled by particularly the human rights record of both uh, countries. So there is an opportunity there for closer collaboration, more of a unified and consolidated strategy to some extent. I would say one of the, if I, it's hard to even say this, and I do happen to be of Ukrainian descent, but it's very hard to say that there are any silver linings uh, coming out of this horrific uh, circumstance in Ukraine, but one lining, silver lining that there is in my book is seeing German foreign policy change overnight, uh, where there you had uh, you know, a plan to move forward with Nord Stream 2, which was absolutely not a good path to take in terms of being held hostage uh, uh, to, to uh, uh, Moscow in terms of uh, gas. Uh, but secondly, is that they immediately said that they were going to up their contribution to NATO and burden sharing. But the third, um, they also were reluctant to give any assistance, military assistance. They gave helmets to, um, to the Ukrainians. And after that, that shifted, very significant shift. And they started giving them the equipment that the Ukrainians requested, meaning the military equipment, surface to air missiles, uh, 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 javelin stingers, different kinds of equipment that the Ukrainians requested. So my first opportunity here, I think that this has brought us closer together. That doesn't mean, and I don't want to suggest that we are completely aligned in all areas. Uh, I could cite differences, but I think it has brought us with more of a kind of uh, a focus of purpose, unity of purpose here, and an opportunity to build upon. Let me mention another, and that is uh, uh, more in what we call the soft power area, two of it, two, two items. One is areas which matter to all of our countries, is this issue of environmental stewardship, that's what I would call it, uh, that uh, uh, there are so many different ways. I don't know if any of you have ever been to China, but I've been to China and it's very hard to breathe. You know, the air is very polluted. Um, uh, Russia also, uh, same, same kind of thing. So here, the notion of providing some kind of collaboration in areas uh, where citizens, uh, basic people, uh, live better lives because of environmental stewardship about the air, the water, uh, and so forth. And then global health. It's hard for me to say this after what we witnessed, you know, regarding the pandemic and the origins of the pandemic, but nevertheless, it's an area that there has to be global collaboration on. Uh, all of our uh, countries are affected. Uh, uh, infectious diseases don't stop at borders. So here, um, uh, for example, in January of uh, last year, there was a WHO team that did go to Wuhan. They were denied, it, denied entry. There has still been pressure put to actually uh, try to uh, uh, really go back to the roots of what happened and for the benefit of global, the global community. So I pick out the health area uh, as an area that should be pushed. The last area I'd identify is non-proliferation. And I, I have sort of mixed feelings. I put it forward, but I'll tell you why I have mixed feelings. Uh, in 1994, Ukraine gave up its nuclear weapons. That Ukraine was the third largest nuclear uh, uh, powered country in the in the world. It gave up its nuclear weapons in return for the protection of its territorial integrity and its sovereignty. And re Ukrainians are regretting that now. And they say, why did we do that? And here, look what happened. And what's happening to us? And who's coming to our, not, they don't say who's coming to our defense, but who's coming, who's assisting us in enabling us to really fight the strongest fight we can against uh, um, uh, Putin and the uh, Russians. 
Here, uh, I, I would say there's a ramification that's very concerning, and that's Iran and North Korea. Because if you look at Iran and North Korea, they're gonna ask the question, well, why should we, Iran you know, in particular, and North Korea, the path it's on, well, why should we you know, stem our interests and aspirations of becoming nuclear powers? And um, well, it's in our interest. Look what happened in Ukraine. I could almost see that argument being used by them in this case. So here is an opportunity, I still will say, the opportunity is bringing these issues to the forefront, at least. Uh, I'm not saying there's an easy solution to that, but making there a greater awareness. But what it does bring to the forefront is certainly the opportunity to build our own defense foundation. Um, uh, we have a strong, def we need a strong defense, we don't cut back. Um, then we are well prepared to take on uh, actually this competition and which does have ramifications for the uh, non-proliferation area. So in sum, I'll say it's a very challenging time. It's one of the most challenging times. Uh, Professor Natsios and I, uh, we worked in government a good number of years and uh, I think uh, the times that um, uh, we both worked in the Reagan administration, um, I believe uh, in that case, uh, uh, I did work in the Reagan administration, but why I'm mentioning it, uh, of course, one of the strong pronouncements of uh, President Reagan was peace through strength. I'm a firm believer in that. That was then, and that certainly is now, in fighting this fight. It's not only about the military base that we have, it's about a strong economy, and it's also about our moral narrative, really standing up for what we believe. Let me stop there and um, welcome Professor Natsios up here and look forward to our conversation exchange and to your questions and comments, and thank you. Just, uh, I actually wrote an article for uh, PRISM. It doesn't have a huge circulation, but they say it's an elite group of people that read it. It's a military <laughs> journal at the National Defense University on Strategy, and they asked me to write a chapter or a article on foreign aid during a period of great power rivalry, and I suggested at the time it was written that health might be some one area that we might work with the Chinese and Russians on uh, and I've changed my mind on that. And the reason I have is a study was done by uh, scientists, uh, computer scientists, or uh, information scientists at um, GW, George Washington University, and the Johns Hopkins School of Public Health, which is arguably one of the finest in the world. And they tracked the anti-vaccine messaging and there are about six conspiracy theories that are making the rounds. This is an Illuminati conspiracy that goes back to the French Revolution. They're poisoning us if you take a vaccine. This is before COVID, by the way. This is had nothing to do with COVID. Uh, that if you uh, take a vaccine or get a vaccine, you will not be able to have children. You'll be sterile. Anyway, it's, it's being run by the Russians, not the Chinese. There's no evidence the Chinese are doing this. Putin was complaining that his people refused to get vaccinated. You know, this stuff was written in English. The, the R Russians have a high degree of education. They can read English. <laughs> They're reading the stuff he's producing, because his, it's, it's Russian bots that are doing it, and the evidence is that the cyber ministry in Moscow is paying for this. And the problem is it's directed against the Europeans and Americans, but Africans are reading it. We're seeing growing vaccine hesitancy in Africa because they're reading this stuff on the internet. A, a large part of it is coming from Russia. So a lot of the anti-vaccine movement, people don't realize it in the United States, is actually sourced in Russia. May, may I comment yes. on that? When I was sharing uh, the point about health being an opportunity, I admittedly, I'll say, I feel a little bit double-edged for the reasons you've stated. But let me make a distinction. And I, again, I gave a broad overview 
But the distinction is, I think we need to determine uh, uh, the government, split the government off, or the regime, versus people. And in this case, let me give you an example right now relative to Russia. One of the areas that I had in my portfolio when I was at the State Department was science. What does that mean? Actually dealing with scientists. And here I have now collaborated with the National Academy of Science and also with the AAAS, the American Association for the you know, <coughs> Advancement of Science. Why? By the way, they're trying to get out, by the way, out of Russia, scientists. Many of them feel that they are in jeopardy. Um, and so I'll tell you, Andrew, when I use the term opportunity, it's not, don't only look at it in the context of government, because right now I don't disagree at all with what you're saying, in either end with the Chinese or the Russians, but there are those individuals like the scientists in Russia who want to be out and don't want to be compromised in this current situation of what's taking place. Those are individuals who, by the way, I think, given their knowledge, uh, given uh, you know uh, the, the kinds of work and research they've done, have something to contribute. So we have to forget, I mean, we can't forget not to leave those people behind. I completely agree with and you. And making Paul. that distinction yeah. between the governments or regimes and then the people here. I, I completely agree with you. The, the sad thing is, I actually said it in my article that the communists would have been embarrassed by what the Russians are doing in vaccines yeah. right now. And the reason is, uh, the, one, the, the great scourge of the 20th century and the 19th century was smallpox. Maybe a hundred, the one estimate is that a billion people have died of smallpox in the last century. The lower estimates are 300 million. It's the worst, by far, worst disease. And it doesn't exist anymore. I don't know if you know that. The last case of smallpox was either 1977 or 1979. I forget the exact year. And uh, the, the World Health Organization's standard is if the disease does not exist after seven years, then it's been, uh, it's been eradicated. The only human disease we've ever eradicated is smallpox. And that happened because in the 1960s, the United States and the Soviet Union agreed to cooperate on one thing, because they were being ravaged by it too, is to eliminate smallpox. And we worked actually, we use the uh, World Health Organization as an organization. It's, it's very weak institutionally. That's a different subject. But it was very useful to get the developing world involved because they were suspicious of the US and the Soviet Union on this. So it would not have happened unless we had worked with the Soviet Union. And I was a hardliner, anti-communist. But if it worked, it worked. It was highly successful. And I was hoping that it would work in this case. But the, the research on the Russian role in confusing people on vaccines generally, not, and, and Putin was, I think he was astonished, I was astonished he was complaining as to why his own people wouldn't get vaccinated. They have the lowest vaccination rate for an educated country in the world. At one point they're only at 20%, I think they're only at 50% now. We're, we're way, way beyond them. One fast footnote, just a footnote, I, I can't help myself because when I was Under Secretary of State, I actually had the health office, and I did work with Andrew's team at the AID, Agency for International Development, and then Health and Human Services, among others. We were dealing with avian influenza. Right. And it was interesting to me in this case to make a distinction. The Chinese did not let anyone come in to investigate. The UN wanted to come in and send a neutral team to come in just to investigate. They refused any kind of investigation. Now, I will say, in this case, the Russians did let them oh, come they in. Did? Yes, they did. And actually contributed to the kinds of specimens that were drawn. So there was a greater awareness of sort of some of the mutations from avian influenza and what kind of strategy should be deployed. But in both cases, you know, you like to think that you know, uh, uh, here, there's, well, there's a fundamental difference. Uh, I think that basically, not that it's perfect, but I think that here, our own society, we look at the welfare of our people. And when there's a wrong, there's a tension that's drawn to it. Uh, there, you know, steps are taken, but not for the welfare of the citizenry. Yeah, yeah. Full right. stop. So um, how important do you think is the American oil and gas industry 
uh, in dealing with the Ukraine crisis, not because we've shut off our, our, our uh, and the Europeans have as well, uh, oil and of course gas is critically important to Europe. We aren't getting, we're not getting Russian gas, but they are. And how, how does that, the politics of oil and gas work with respect to what's happening in Ukraine? It's 100% important. And of course, being here in Texas, uh, uh, I'll say this, and even if I weren't here in Texas, it's 100% important. And the reason why is, first of all, uh, uh, let me start with the fact that Russia itself is not modernized. Its economy is totally dependent on uh, energy, and it has manipulated it. And I, I certainly, I was one of the people who, right from the beginning, was opposed to the Nord Stream 2. I admired the fact that countries like Poland said that they would not, not, uh, 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 you know, they were going to cut off any kind of uh, 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 gas uh, imports from Russia. So here it, it matters greatly because the economy is very, very reliant on uh, its oil and gas. Uh, certainly it's gas into Europe. The United States does import, by the way, uh, oil from Russia, which there was also an outcry why are we importing oil from Russia? So my answer to you is 100%. This matters greatly. It matters in terms of a, a, an impactful, impunitive, punitive measure against Russia. Yes, Russia set up a pipeline to China. That was concluded after about a decade of negotiations. But quite frankly, um, I will say that that's not its primary market. Its primary market has certainly been Europe. And the challenge here is, and the Europeans come back and will say, all right, well, if we take the steps like you and cut off, how are we going to provide for our citizens? So then this comes to us. We need to lift uh, uh, these, uh, 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 you know, the, the, the barriers to production, to production in the United States. Um, I worked on climate change issues and I use the term environmental stewardship. I'm a strong believer that you can do both uh, in this case. You can move forward with this kind of production mm -hmm. and at the si same time be environmentally responsible. Here, we need to do that. Uh, we should never have cut off the pipeline with Canada. That was a mistake. So I am a strong proponent that not only A for us, in terms of our own independence and being energy independent. But secondly, here, helping Europe, because if Europe's cut off and agrees to be cut off, where do they get their, their energy supplies from? So that's the second piece. And then the third is the punitive action against uh, um, uh, Putin directly. 65% of the Russian economy is oil and gas, 50%. I'm sorry, oil and gas and minerals. 50% is oil and gas, 15% is minerals. That's the economy. They're a petrostate. And as Nick Eberstadt, my, our mutual friend at AEI, at the American Enterprise Institute, I was just talking with him today or emailing with him today, and uh, he said there is no petrostate that has ever become a, a great power in history. If your economy is based simply on extraction, you're not a great power. And, and uh, that's the great... Achilles' heel of Putin is uh, now. But what, what I have yes. to inject this. Yes. Sorry, sorry, I can't help myself. I don't know how many of you heard uh, Senator McCain. He gave a definition here in this context. Uh, I'm going to paraphrase. I, I'm not going to deliver it as in the funniest way that he did. But he said, "Do you know what Russia really is? Do you know what it is?" He said, "It is a corrupt, terrible." gas station, it's a crummy, corrupt gas station masquerading as a country. <laughs> so I remember him saying that. Yeah, I mean, his delivery was, was just perfect. So, But uh, you get the point. <laughs> sure. So should we redefine, uh, by the way, are there cards, are, are the cards been passed out? If you have, a, I'm reading questions that were submitted before the event. Um, by the way, this is being recorded and they're, people watching uh, at home by, or their office by Zoom. Um, so if you have, oh, okay, you get, fine, thank you. Um, so 
Let's talk about cyber because okay. there have been, I'll tell you an amusing story. Not that I go to the uh, barber very often, but I was at the barber <laughs> and uh, the lady uh, who was taking reservations was saying the entire system for the thousand, it's a, it was a, uh, uh, you know, it's a chain of, of stores, the entire reservation system is in chaos. It was the same weekend that there were cyber attacks against American industry and American business. And I said, I, I think I know why your systems, she said, why? He said, Putin. I said, Putin's attacking barbershops? That's really uh, <laughs> kind of desperate. I said, well, in my case, it doesn't really make that much difference. <laughs> I know it could paralyze some people, but it was, it was as silly as that, it, that the, the virus that they uh, Russians had because we complained about it. I think it was several years ago. I think it was actually when President Trump was in office. Uh, it was, I thought it was amusing that the kind of software the reservation system was using was vulnerable to this. I mean, I, they had not taken any measures to protect themselves who would attack barbershops, apparently. I mean, the Russian well, this is, a, this is a key issue, and I referenced it uh, just yes, briefly in my, right. in my comments as new technologies and I'd highlight cyber and also disinformation because the way information has been manipulated has also been extremely problematic because of perceptions. And let me just say, if I could quickly make two comments on each. On cyber, the fact is that we have witnessed the Russians really deploy cyber attacks. One of the most uh, 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 egregious ones happened years ago against Estonia. And if you know Estonia, one of the uh, small independent Baltic states, the Estonians, though, however, moved quickly in fortifying themselves uh, against future cyber attacks. Now, it's a small country, but why I cite it is because, quite frankly, many experts do go to Estonia to learn and benefit from their experience and to hear, even though it's on a smaller scale, what steps they actually took to fortify themselves going forward. Ukraine has been hit several times, not just only during the recent um, uh, invasion of Ukraine, but even before. And then Sweden, Sweden, uh, I, I cited. Sweden actually came forward because there have been cyber attacks and also targeting uh, their submarines, uh, actually. And you know that also another very dramatic shift that's taken place is both Sweden and Finland are looking at becoming members of NATO. So are we prepared, the United States? I can't say to you I'm a cyber expert, but I will say this. I think most who are, and homing in on it, really believe that we have not, meaning the United States has not taken the kinds of steps that it should and could in this area of protectiveness. So when I mentioned about bolstering our defense foundation, I see this very much in that domain. And a word about disinformation, if I, if, I, if I can. Here, I think that we have not really also gone on the offensive relative to the kind of disinformation that has been waged. Uh, it has gotten much more sophisticated, uh, and it, per per it impacts audiences. On TV, maybe you've seen this, when different news stations are talking about, well, my gosh, Putin and what going, going, is going on in Russia, Putin has like very high popularity. How can it be that in Russia he has high popularity? Are, pe are people not seeing you know, the images of what's taking place and then this recent massacre in Bucha? Um, you know, the fact is that here uh, there's complete control over the images. The term war is not used. Um, they recently passed a law saying that any journalist foreign or domestic in Russia will get 15 years in prison uh, if they use a war, that there's a war going on. There's total control of the, of the media and the actual uh, messaging. So people do not know what's taking place yet. <laughs> yet, I say that, yet. So bluntly speaking, there's a war going on on those two fronts. What was very interesting, one of the things that happened after the last cyber attack um, and I don't remember whether it was, I think it was early last year it happened. I thought it was just great. Um, uh, the cyber attack took place and our response was not announced. 
it's pretty clear it happened, they released a photograph across Russia of the thousand room mansion that cost $300 million to build or $500 million on the, in the Crimea uh, and, uh, or, or on the Black Sea. I don't know if it was in Crimea or not. And it was Putin's mansion. And that one image, just a picture, Putin didn't deny it was his. He said, well, someone gave it to me. I mean, someone <laughs> gave him a $300 million house. I mean, it was a palace. It collapsed his poll ratings among younger people. He, he's very popular among older people, but the polling showed there is, was, at the time, uh, some independent polling being done. He had a 35% approval rating among people under 35. It went down from 35 to 20%. It's even lower now, okay? So he's, he's lost the younger generation. I was having a, t a medical test done <laughs> just as I was on the air attacking Putin because of uh, Ukraine, and the young man had an accent. I said, uh, is that a Ukrainian accent? I, I was praying it was a Ukrainian accent. He said, no, I'm Russian. I said, you are. He said, yes, and I know who you are, Mr. Natsios. I said, you do. And you were about to <laughs> operate on me. And he said, no, I hate Putin. I said, you do. I said, you, you can calm down. I said, am I, sh am I sure, am I sure, before I go under that you are anti-Putin? And he said, well, my family are Russian Jews. They don't like the... Putin anyway, but in particular, uh, we left Russia, my family. I grew up here. I've been here since I was, a, you know, in my uh, teens. Sign significantly, there's been a brain drain, actually, yes. as they say it, and of younger people out of Russia because they don't believe that they have opportunities. Exactly. And, uh, and, and actually, the interesting thing for me, because I spent a lot of my career working on human rights issues earlier on in my career, and then when I looked at the demonstrations taking place actually in Russia, believe it or not, it wasn't so much out over human rights, but you had a lot of younger people demonstrating because they felt that they didn't have economic opportunities and they didn't like exactly what you're saying, that you know, uh, they, 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 they uh, were able to type the system as being very fraudulent. And, <laughs> they, they wanted to advance themselves uh, rightfully, and so many, many have left uh, Russia. Uh, and yes. Nick Eberstadt, who you mentioned, for the students in the audience, you definitely should look at his, his work, because he's written some terrific things about dem demography and demographic changes, and in this, he's talked about how there's been that drain out of Russia. You not only have the highest, uh, you know, mortality rate because of drinking and smoking, but, um, uh, but also you have a brain drain from there because of these constraints. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and he actually said one thing we could do to really damage Russia is to welcome the 200,000, make sure, of course, they really do have the technical knowledge, but bring them to the United States because it would help our high-tech industry. The, Brit the, the uh, Russian computer scientists are quite brilliant. Uh, and if they're working legitimately in the private sector, and we'd have to make sure that they were, uh, they could actually enhance our economy. And he actually proposed that. Nick is a conservative, uh, and it was very interesting. Uh, he's not, he's not uh, anti-immigrants at all. He's pro-immigration. But um, he said it would actually damage Russia to encourage us. Now, I, I, I've just written a piece, I don't know if it's going to pu be published or not, on what really is going on. In, it's a different theory of what's happening in the Ukraine. But um, I looked into the 200,000 Russians, and the Washington Post just did a study of the 200,000 Russians, and they actually identified a large percentage of, of the people who were in the streets demonstrating against what Putin had done in Ukraine, and they're now afraid of getting arrested. But they all tend to be very young in their 20s yeah. and 30s, and they're, they're scientists. Mm -hmm. So they're exactly who you were speaking about. Uh, and they're, they're, they're not, they're the only border still open to them uh, is in Kazakhstan, interestingly enough. They haven't closed the border, so a lot of them are going there. They had gone to Turkey. A large number had gone to Turkey, Armenia, and Georgia, and now those borders are closed. They can't go to Europe. And the head of the Wagner Group, which is basically mercenaries that work for the in British, uh, British uh, Russian intelligence, and they're the ones who are committing all these atrocities in, in Africa, um, the head of it publicly said we should stop these people from leaving. And Putin won't stop it. You know why? He doesn't, he's afraid of those people being in the country because they are the ones leading the demonstrations against him 
on the streets, and he just assumed they leave. So he has a choice. Save the country by keeping the scientists in the country or get them out of the country because they're a threat to him. He chose the latter, which is, it tells you where his priorities are. Right. Um, there is, uh, I've read, and I'm sure you have read, and you may have written on this, um, a concern that by the, uh, the use of the dollar uh, and our power over the, uh, we are the exchange currency of the world, as you know, right. which means, are, are the, the, not the exchange, sure. the, well, we are the oil exchange currency of the world, but we are the reserve the currency country. of the world. Right. Right. And the question is, is there, and there is, actually, we now have evidence of it, that countries are going to move away from the dollar um, because we've used it so aggressively against the Russians that other countries are worried we could use it against them. The Saudis now are saying, all it, prior to this, all oil transactions had to be in dollars. You could not buy and sell oil without using American dollars. And that is now changing for the first time. So could you comment on that? Are we at, at risk of, because it's allowed us not to worry about balance of payment changes, uh, uh, exchange rates, and because of the reserve currency of the world. W what risk are we at? Well, I, I'm, I'm not an economist like my father, who is Andrew's <laughs> professor, but, but I, I, I will say this. I am very concerned about that. I was very concerned when I read the uh, recent Saudi statements to this effect, and, and then not just only the Saudis, but the Chinese, going back to the challenge <clears throat> from China. China has itself also put forward a challenge regarding our currency as serving as a base. Um, that's very, uh, very uh, uh, concerning here uh, from a number of standpoints, not only in terms of the kind of role that the United States has played, uh, <laughs> it's uh, a very balanced uh, leadership role, uh, uh, cohesiveness, but secondly, it will uh, uh, be disruptive disruptive certainly uh, to the kinds of, and feed on the kinds of practices that I've mentioned before, like the very predatory practices wielded by the Chinese as we've witnessed, uh, where they don't abide by the rules of the World Trade Organization, or even just basic rules. So it's going to, it's going to disrupt, it will be a disruptive factor in terms of trade. It will be a disruptive factor in terms of just overall kind of economic stability. It adds a whole other dimension, um, certainly to the way in which we conduct um, uh, business. Um, um, so it, it is very concerning. I, I'm also, I would be concerned by the fact, I don't know what we're doing to try to turn that around and actually go on the offensive against it, rather than just listening to the statements, but actually taking action, concerted action, to really ensure that, that, that there's a counterweight from others who would be supportive of the dollar and understanding the economic ramifications of it uh, for them. And I haven't witnessed that. So A, there's a major problem here, and B, what are we doing about it? I haven't seen that there's a kind of a coalition that comes together to provide a strong counterweight against that action. So we had uh, Sir John Major, the former oh. Prime Minister of the UK under when President Bush was in office, pre president, our President Bush was in office. He spoke here and gave a lecture. In fact, we published his lecture because it's such a brilliant defense of the American-led international order. So one of the most beautifully written, elegant pieces of writing and, and, and reasoning that I've ever seen, actually. But when he came, he was privately saying to me, he didn't, I don't think he said it, in, in, although I can't remember we've said it publicly or not, but he said during his time in the Q&A that one of the reasons we have not been more, and this was two years, this was before COVID, so this is three years ago. He said, much to my surprise, I kind of thought it might be true. He said, well, the reason the UK government and your own government and the French government and the German have not been more aggressive with Putin is that this massive capital outflow, it's oligarch money, about 110 men, or all men, uh, own 30% of the wealth of Russia. And it wasn't made by building an industry like uh, Gates did or, or Apple or one of our other companies. It was by looting the economy, They're stealing the money. They're thieves. They're not 
they, they did not create wealth. They, they, they took it, and it's extractive wealth. Mm -hmm. But he said that money all went to the, uh, Wall Street. It went to Silicon Valley. It's surprising how much of our computer industry, our high technology, is actually the stock is owned by the oligarchs. And, and he said, I can tell you in London, a huge amount of it went to London. A lot of the oligarchs live in London. Right. And so he said the same thing. This is what I, I did not know this. He said, why do you think Chamberlain tried to make a deal with Hitler? Do you think it was because Chamberlain was naive? It's because the Nazis put huge amounts of German money in British banks. And they didn't want to annoy the business community. And we're doing the same thing again. We're allowing the investment of money to, to uh, restrain our foreign policy. And now we've paid for it. I, I, I think we've paid for it myself. Um, There's a very good question. Uh, and I've, I've seen some comment on this, but I like your, your opinion. You, you, I, I did not serve, by the way, in the Reagan, Reagan administration. administration. I, actually, I was serving in the Massachusetts legislature That's during right. the Reagan administration. After I said that to you, but I was thinking Andy, well, Andy, Andy Card came. Yes, yeah, they yeah, do yeah, confuse yeah. us. Yes. <laughs> Andy and I both served in the House for eight years, but I, I was there 12 years, he was there eight years. But anyway, um, Nixon opened the, uh, the uh, conversation with the Chinese. Chinese right. Kissinger's secret trips, it's a, you know, one of the great moments of American history. At the time, the reason he did it was not because we trusted the Chinese, it's because we trusted the Russians even less. We, they were more of a threat. And, and uh, the Chinese didn't love us. They almost went to war with Russia in the 1970s, uh, as you, some of you may know, there was on the edge of war between Russia and China. And I think there could be again myself. I think Putin has made a terrible mistake and, uh, by allying himself with China because where all this gas and oil and mineral wealth is, it's Siberia. You know how many people live in Siberia? 40 million people. 40 million people in a vast area. And the, a Russian demographer has done a study saying within 10, 20 years, there, there's going to be a 50% reduction in the population of Siberia. They're all leaving. So there'll be 20 million people in an area the size of the United States and Canada put together. It's, it's vast. And it has a third of the mineral and oil and gas wealth of the whole world in Siberia. And there will only be 20 million people there, or Russians. I'd be a little nervous with 1.4 billion Chinese sitting on the other side of the border. Uh, but anyway, so the question to you is, Nixon and the Chinese, Mao Zedong, made a deal, not because they loved each other, but because they were concerned about Russian power and they used balance of power politics. That's what Henry Kissinger was so good at. Could you see a time when we would somehow make it a deal with the Chinese because the Russians were a threat? Because they do have the massive nuclear weapons. I, well, let me make two comments. First, this what's is a question. The state I'm not suggesting this. I'm making, no. uh, proposing a question. Here. No, no, no. I, yeah, okay. I, I, I got that. Um, uh, <laughs> 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 I did get that. Um, I first wanted just to clarify where I see the relationship between Russia and China first. The relationship between Russia and China, uh, I would not define as just a kind of marriage of convenience, but I also don't see it as some tightly woven alliance. Uh, I've used, and uh, with others, the term alignment and why they do have certain goals and objectives vis-a-vis -vis the United States in which they are aligned. And I identified it in my opening remarks just purely and simply uh, US <coughs> diminishing US power uh, and influence abroad and fragmenting our alliances, uh, putting a wedge in our alliances and our partnerships. And they have those common interests. Um, they have some other common interests, but Look at what's happening over Ukraine. The Chinese abstained in the United Nations on the resolution condemning Russian action in Ukraine um, on one hand. On the other hand, they have followed the narrative to a T relative to what Putin's narrative is. They don't call this a war uh, or an invasion. It's a military, special military operation. Um, they also have been very careful in their choice of words in describing what's going on. They do express concern about the loss of life, 
and they expressed concern about territorial integrity. But the fact is that they are following more that narrative and being supportive of, of, of Putin. So first, uh, how do I define this? It's a very careful walk that they are making at this time. It's very balanced. Uh, they do not want to be so associated because Putin's being described as a pariah and an outlier, and they don't want to be taken down, certainly not Xi Jinping. So there's that side of support, but also distance, without a doubt, first describing that. You ask the question, would we be in a situation where we, with China, would come together, and I think you said against you know, the Russians. I would be very cautious about you know, uh, aligning with one or the other. Personally, why? Because I don't think either can actually be trusted in terms of their goals and objectives. And if we think that by purely going to the Chinese, because there might be maybe some common interests, are they in the end going to take a step against Russia? I just don't see it. I don't see it. And even right now, you may have seen that the Biden administration, um, you had the president have a conversation with Xi Jinping. You had the national security advisor meet with the Chinese official, uh, Yang Yishu. You had uh, uh, the secretary of state meet with the Chinese uh, foreign minister, Wang. And in this case, what has been the outcome? They have pressed the Chinese help help get Russia out of Ukraine. Have you seen any results from that diplomacy? I have not seen it. So I, and I don't think the Chinese are going to waste any effort uh, to push the Russians uh, out of the operation, uh, as they would put it, war, as I would put it, uh, in which Russia is engaged in. And finally, there's the question China offered earlier to mediate. Well, huh, um, I could only imagine what result that would bring about. And we should, of course, uh, which we have said absolutely no, no, never to that. So I do not see, though, okay. on that scenario. I, I, that agree, I agree with you, Paula. At I all. agree with you. Uh, there has been a debate uh, led by uh, some of the structural realists, Professor Mearsheimer at the University of Chicago is a structural realist uh, that we caused this by uh, the extension of uh, under uh, first under President Clinton and then under President our President Bush. To, I shouldn't say our President Bush. We referred to 41 as our President Bush. I, I mean, I meant W. That uh, during the the Bush administration, uh, I think we encouraged uh, Georgia and uh, Ukraine to. Yes, it was Continue. under W, definitively. Right. But, but there were other countries that joined during the Clinton administration. But it was, it was also under George H.W. Bush when uh, uh, actually with the uh, changes taking place in then, you know, uh, Europe, Baker actually had, uh, you know, exchange and a conversation with Gorbachev over this, these very issues yes. Could about Could you talk NATO about that a little bit? Did we cause this? No. I, I disagree with Mersheimer completely <laughs> <laughs> on this issue. Uh, let me first say that when um, uh, uh, there was, and actually I even referred to this earlier today with a, 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 a dear friend living in Houston, how when you look at what, interestingly enough, the current Secretary of State, Blinken, he gave a press conference on this very issue because he wanted to clear the air on these allegations that have been made that A, we caused it, and B, that we left Russia to the side. So let me make several points here. First, no, we did not cause it. Two, if you look at historically what took place at the time, Secretary Baker had a series of conversations and very clearly stated that there would be a NATO enlargement. And at the time, in fact, Gorbachev knew this, and there was a term used of that Europe would become whole and free. And he embraced it. Uh, and there was actual language to this effect, number one. But most significantly, 
The reason why I disagree with what Mearsheimer says and others who have taken this position is because we actually brought Russia into what's known as the Russia NATO Council. And that was to alleviate any concerns they had about uh, what NATO would be doing. NATO is a collective defense organization. It's not an offensive, it's a defensive, you know, or uh, alliance, number one. But number two, by bringing in the Russians into this council, it would afford them the opportunity of having a one-on-one -on -one exchange with NATO members. And number two, it would also apprise them of exercises, other kinds of steps. There was a full transparency. So I do not see that here that we were taking action that would be concerning or would be threatening. On the contrary, they were brought in. Now, by the way, at the time, Kissinger actually, I believe, wrote an article and came out saying that we should bring Russia into NATO. And there were those who said, and I was in that case, uh, arguing, no, that was very premature of doing that. Uh, but the idea of this council was a good one because, again, it would not be exclusive, it would be inclusive. So here, no, we were not the cause. Um, also, um, what is being presented now by Putin is revisionism. And I'm going to add one other point here that's key. The comment about not having Ukraine in NATO, quite frankly, that's not really the issue of what's taking place here. It really isn't. And some argue, well, why did Putin take this action? In my book, I don't view him as being erratic or that this was not predictable. If you go back to 2005, Putin's been very clear in what he has wanted. He said then, that was when he said that the breakup of the Soviet Union was the worst thing that could have happened in that century, you know. And then in 2007, at the Munich Security Conference in Germany, he said very clearly, Western values are not our values. We do not like the United States because it's unipolar and we will not accept it and we will not accept unipolarity. We also are not in favor of NATO and NATO expansion. He did say that at, in his watch. And then fourthly, and very significantly, he said, we can take any kind of action, any kind of action on behalf of Russian nationals, wherever they may be. And that was the blueprint for what was to come in Georgia in particular, and then of course, it was a test case in terms of Donbass and also in terms of the illegal annexation of, of, of Crimea. Um, that was just a very, you know, uh, uh, like I said, test case of it. So he's moved forward. Why did he move forward at this time? I would submit the reason why he moved forward at this time was fundamentally because of our actions in Afghanistan. Uh, we were very much perceived as weak. I'm not going to, excuse me, I'm not going to suggest to you that the action of taking out our troops after 20 years of being in there for any service men or women in this audience or on, online, um, I, I have to say I think that was a long period of time and our service men and women are to be commended for what they did in this regard. I do think it was right to come out although I would have left a residual force there. That's my own uh, proclivity because if we're going to be engaged and worry about terrorists, uh, we went in in the first place to counter, if you recall, Osama bin Laden, uh, as was reported, was not just only Osama bin Laden, but other terrorists found Afghanistan as a haven and by going away completely, then uh, the question will be, will there be a rise of terrorist activity there again uh, by, by completely moving out? But back to my point, our actions and the way it was handled was fundamentally viewed as being weak, as, as also not being engaged internationally. And I want to say that, but at the same time, with respect to as I said, those that have served and for the 20 year period, which again, it was the right decision, but it was how it was implemented. 
Uh, and secondly, what was the end game there that I think was not, not correct, not the front end about drawing out and not being there. Um, but for Putin, he viewed it as weak, and he viewed it that this was an opportunity and a time to come in and um, um, uh, I invade. And actually, um, here it's, as I said, not about NATO, it's about Ukraine. Definitely, he's made these statements that Ukraine is not a country. Uh, again, as I said, I'm of Ukrainian descent, that Ukraine's not a country, uh, that uh, these are really Russians, these are not Ukrainians, there's no such thing as Ukraine, it's not a country, it's not, not really a people. Um, it's horrendous, I mean, it is absolutely horrendous. Um, what's, what's, what's taken place. But it's more about that, I would say. And when you see that innocent civilians are being you know, massacred here, you have to ask yourself why in this case. Um, uh, and uh, quite frankly, uh, you know, all I see is that he is trying to literally uh, demolish and almost destruct everything that Ukraine is about. I mean, it goes well beyond, if you could see, as I'm saying, it definitely goes well beyond NATO and the issue of NATO. Because if it was just about NATO, you have to ask yourself, Zelensky has already said, we won't go into NATO. Look, we won't go into NATO. We'll also be neutral. But look at what's happening on the ground. That goes well beyond just this issue of NATO. I had to say that. Well, I, I, uh, this, the article I've written argues that uh, the goal of Russia all along has not been, it's not about NATO. I think they played along with that because there's a group of realists in the United States who are arguing we caused the problem. And so, of course, Putin's going to say, oh, yes, we agree with them. You caused the problem. The reality is what they're doing now is trying to deprive Ukraine of uh, its coastline on the Black Sea. 100%. And, and there is now evidence 100%. by statements they've made that they intend to go after Moldova next. And we did a calculation when I was writing the article as to what percentage of the boundaries of, of, the Ukraine, of Ukraine will be controlled by Russia or its colonial mm -hmm. power. Because if, if they take the entire coastline and Moldova, 77% of the borders of, of, of uh, Ukraine will be controlled by Russia or its, its, um, its um, I wouldn't even call them allies. If you invade a country and take it over, they're not allies, they're, they're colonies. 100% on your thesis, and let me, just for those of you who are interested, actually, after the, in 2014, after the illegal annexation of Crimea and the invasion of the Donbass region. There were those of us who follow these uh, details very, very closely. We all agreed when there was a discussion about where next and what will happen next. You know where we all predicted is, and the way it's pronounced is Mariupol. And Mariupol, you have seen, they've locked it down, totally locked it down, and literally people are trying to get out of there because they've been massacred. I mean, totally, again, going back to the being massacred. You, and the reason why is for the reason that uh, um, uh, Professor Nazios just referenced, and that is that it's a key. It's the land bridge, actually, to the area and into the Black Sea and into Crimea. Yes. And they want that strategic space. It's absolutely key and crucial. We actually had predicted at the time that that would be the next invasion, if you will, that we, we would see. The way this has turned out was different, I will admit, but I think they rebooted. I think they definitely, there were several miscalculations. The miscalculation of number one, they underestimated, and in fact, many underestimated Zelensky, and Zelensky has come forward as a full, strong force and a very astute leader. They miscalculated uh, the Ukrainian armed forces and their resourcefulness, thinking about how little that they have to be able to use in fighting against massive Russian military. And then thirdly, what's very revealing is, and I'm someone who my own, you mentioned the PhD, and my PhD is dealing with the Russian military. To me, I mean, it's fantastic watching 
how they have not succeeded. They were supposed to get all of Ukraine in three days, actually, and seize uh, Kiev in three days. And you see what's uh, taking place here, and they haven't succeeded at it. But uh, the issue of that tier below, 100%, you're 100%, if you're, that's a primary thesis of your article, I would agree completely with it. And just so you know, there are others. Some of our former ambassadors who've, who we've Ambassador had. Ambassador Knapper is ba making that argument to me. Well, uh, I'd also say Herbst, yes, uh, Taylor, Herbst, uh, yeah. uh, uh, who is a military guy, uh, Bill Taylor. All of us actually were all focused on Mariupol for a number of years, and we were wondering why that didn't happen. And now we're witnessing that playing out, but it's absolutely one of the most key areas, bar now, none. What, what they what we, what we've missed in this is after they took the Crimea, they drove out 115,000 Tartars who have been there since the 13th century, and uh, Ukrainians, and they brought in 250,000 Siberian Russians. Not Russians from Moscow, Siberian Russians. Why? They have no familial connections in Ukraine. 11 million Russians have relatives in the Ukraine. And so Putin doesn't want those people settling in the, in the Crimea. He wants people who have no relationship at all. The other people being brought into, the, uh, into Crimea, this is before the current invasion, have been people who are retired from the intelligence service, their, their, their CIA, the, from the uh, defense ministries, military officers. They're the ones who are being given deals on land. They're being deliberately resettled in the Crimea to russify it. And I believe what they're doing in Mariupol is to level the city, like they did in Grozny, in, in Chechnya, level the city, kill everybody in it. That's why they're not letting people leave. I'm sorry to say that, but I think they're trying to kill everybody, and they're going to rebuild a Russian city with rep Russian population from Siberia, because that's exactly what they did in the Crimea. Right, yeah. right. Anyway, we're now at 11.10. We're over. I do want to thank you all for coming and for your questions. We didn't ask every single question, but we got to most of them. Thank you very much, and thank you, Paula, for thank being you. with us. We thank thank you. Thank you.